Welcome to part four of our five part video series. This part is going to cover resolution writing. So what is a resolution you may be asking? The goal of every Model UN conference is to create a multifaceted solution that addresses all aspects of the problem. So a resolution is basically the aforementioned block in the previous video. When you get together with a group of people, you all together write the resolution together. So it's like a teamwork activity. And yeah, the chairs will be judging you based off how well you can work in a team. There's signatories and sponsors. Well, actually, sponsors and signatories for the bill. The sponsors are like the five, up to five delegates who have the most role in writing the bill. And they're the ones who end up going up and presenting it later. And the signatories are just people who are willing to see the bill even be debated. And we'll talk more about that later in this meeting. But anyways, the steps to a resolution are the delegates write about proposed solutions in their topic papers and introduce their ideas about solutions in the GSL. This is all old stuff. Um, basically, whatever positions, whatever ideas you are having as a delegate to as a proposed solution to the problem, then you would put into the resolution. And collaborating during unmoderated caucus to draft and write resolutions, not moderated caucuses, unmoderated caucuses. That's when resolution writing and drafting happens. And a resolution is split into three sections that provide recommendations that can help solve or mitigate the issue that is being debated at hand. Hiram. So uh, the structure of resolution it has three parts to it, the header, the preambulatory clauses, and the operative clauses, which we'll go over uh, promptly. So in the header, you must include the committee name, the topic, the sponsors, and the signatories. And uh, the sponsors are the, the delegates who actually write the growth of the resolution. They write all the content in the resolution. And the signatories are simply delegates who want to see the resolution presented and debated. Um, an example here of a structure for the header it's just a WHO, the topic, the sponsors, and all the signatories. Uh, the number of sponsors and signatories, that'll depend on the size of, uh, size of the committee. And the dice will normally inform you of that. Uh, but that's it for the structure of the resolution. So next, we're going to go into um, preams. So the preams is really important is because um, it really sets the mood for your resolution and how you're going to tackle things. Um, it gives a general overview of the topic and it illustrates important problems that will be addressed. Um, so here uh, is a really good opportunity to use statistics that you found um, in your research and also throughout uh, information that you found throughout uh, the committee as well that people have brought up and you thought of in, uh, as interesting. Um, you can also bring up here, you know, past laws that maybe you want to uh, recognize or acknowledge. Um, uh, so you're illustrating the importance and you're contextualizing. So just a format, um, you're going to, the first word, there's like a specific set of words that you really want to use, um, recognizing, realizing, noting, acknowledging, um, things like words like that. Um, and that word has to be italicized. And then um, it also has to end in ing, uh, you most of the time, unless it's something like guided by. Um, and then the clause itself, it ends in a comma, um, each one ends in a comma, and then uh, you're gonna have the statistic or information or past law that you wanna bring up. Um, so the next slide, th there's some good examples. The next slide has like a good, um, uh, if we can go to that. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a really good example of um, just a format. It's missing the commas, um, but other than that, uh, it's pretty good. Um, so the first one, recognizing the children are much less, must, much less likely to catch COVID-19 than adults, as the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention found that while kids, and then that statistic, that's a good statistic to bring up that sets the basis for your resolution. Um, and then uh, just like I've talked about the verbs or just uh, what the clauses, um, noting, understanding, recalling, emphasizing, acknowledging, words like that, uh, that end in ing and then just the information that you want to bring up. Thank you, Rizwan. So now we get to the bulk of the resolution. What is it actually covering? And this 
this is the operative clause. This is where the solutions are mentioned. This is where you have an opportunity to get into the details and truly explain to the chairs and other delegates in the room, what are you going to do as a block to solve the topic? And this is something, you know, I have chaired conferences before and delegates always forget that you can include subpoints to your operative clauses. You can include subpoints of subpoints. And this is important because you want to be as detailed as possible. The goal is not to finish the resolution the fastest, even though it is beneficial to present first. The goal is to write a detailed paper that will force the other delegates to ask difficult questions that you know they're not able to ask questions because the resolution is so multifaceted and so complete. So you want a resolution that is complete and one that is um, clear. Now let's talk about the formatting. Each clause must be underlined. And we'll be, we will go over some example resolutions at the end of this, uh, this session, and you will see exactly what we mean about the formatting. It is very specific, and you need to follow this formatting in order to uh, successfully submit your paper. Um, in addition to everything being underlined, you also need to end the operative clauses with a semicolon. The last operative clause, which states, remain, to be remain, remain, remain seized on the matter, that ends in a period. That is the last operative clause. Um, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, you know, there is a, a template. You know, first you have your operative clause, then you have your sub clause, and then you can have more sub points. And you know, we talked about this when writing position papers. You want to research well so that you can have good examples, specific organizations, specific details, statistics, whatever the case might be. Um, because a resolution is a complex document. And I, you know, if you, if you really want to, I, I would encourage some of you to go to the actual UN website and look at the actual resolutions. They are very specific. They're, they're almost as long as a book uh, because these are extremely complicated topics. Let's take an example, universal healthcare. How do you solve that? That's going to be very complicated and it's gonna require a lot of details. So please consider this as, as someone in model UN, you want to consider these topics are very, very complex. So approach it like that and, and under, be understanding of that. This is an example. You know, we have more examples coming. I'm not going to go through this one, but I really like this resolution that I wrote during the pandemic. Um, of course, during the pandemic, I had access to uh, research and I was able to research a lot of this during the resolution writing process uh, at the virtual conference. But just take a look at the rest, this whole slide. There's a lot of numbers. There are acronyms. There are a lot of sub points. You know, this is a very specific operative clause. And um, most resolutions will be this long, like the whole resolution, right? In terms of the operative clauses, but this is just one operative clause. Um, so I want you guys to aspire to write an operative clause like this. And um, we can go on to the examples now and, uh, and go through those. So this is on the top of the page are two links that I, I would suggest you guys look over. One is the resolution writing cheat sheet and the other uh, is a resolution template. The cheat sheet is gonna have something very important that I always use when writing resolutions. And that is the verbs that start the phrases, noting. Um, the note's gonna pull it up right now. That bank of words right there, you want to utilize those words for the preamps. And if you scroll down, they, those are the operative clause ones. Have these open. Do not make it harder on yourself when writing resolutions. These words should be available in front of you so you can look at them and use them. You don't have to think of them on the spot. So we can go over the EROG resolution. This was a resolution that was completed um, in 2022 for the Dallas Area Model UN Conference uh, for the ECOSOC committee. As you can see, there's the header uh, as the note covered. And then we have the preamps as Rizwan covered. Um, I would like you to look at the preamps. They are all italicized. And it starts with to the environmental and security, to the environmental and social council, right? That's how you wanna start. You wanna address the committee. So after you have all of that done, you can get down to the operative clauses. Now this resolution I believe has about three or four operative clauses, which is a healthy amount, but sometimes you can have up to five. Um, and this operative clause, you know, all, specifically operative clause two. It has subpoint A, 
subpoint B. And for subpoint B, it has one and two. Um, and if there's anything you guys take out of this session, it's to really get into the details. You want to write offered clauses that are complete and detailed and include examples. Um, one thing that I like to do a lot is to create subcommittees. That's what um, subpoint A of operative clause two says. Calls upon the creation of a subcommittee under ECOSOC called EROG to oversee the transition of nations from oil, natural gas, and other fossil fuels to renewable forms of energy. Uh, why why would we create a subcommittee? Where's one? Why, why should we create a subcommittee? I, I'm, I would like these delegates who are watching to understand. Why should we create a subcommittee? Well, um, you know, obviously uh, you need some sort of um, uh, uh, oversight into what you want to do. Um, so really with the creation of a subcommittee, uh, it's important because um, it really uh, allows you to have that oversight into something you want to do. Um, and obviously you cannot say uh, the committee will oversight, will have that oversight over, um, in this case, it was transition of nations from oil, natural gas, and other fossil fuels to renewable forms of energy, um, because the committee has to deal with so many um, different issues, right? Um, so in order to tackle it, you're going to create a subcommittee um, to then tackle the problem uh, and then uh, hopefully get it to the best of the ability. And this is something that all delegates use in every single resolution. I believe every single resolution that I've had, uh, that I've seen and uh, um, been a part of has had some form of a subcommittee. Um, and uh, it's really important to making sure that you can carry out what you want to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And another important part of resolutions is the funding. This is something that delegates always get wrong. Uh, Vino, do you have any tips about how should delegates, because oftentimes the funding is the foundation for a resolution. How would they set a good foundation? Well, you would have to make sure the funding source is actually viable. You can't just say, oh, take like, ask these poor countries to, or like, these developing countries to help donate or help like fund this sort of, this trillion dollar plan that is going to like, transition from fossil fuels over to um from fossil fuels over to renewable energy that's just not really feasible especially if you have like a lot of developing countries within a block you may have to look towards other sources of funding um like different other sources of funding that you can think of absolutely and other sources like the world bank and the imf are good sources but please do not state that your country is going to give 500 million dollars because you as the delegates have no authority to control your nation's treasury. Uh, you as a country have no authority to appropriate a certain percentage of your GDP. Um, and I, I, I believe this was mentioned, but you are supp we're suggesting things. So you can suggest the country to appropriate 0.01% of the GDP for this resolution. That's a suggestion, right? That could happen if the country approves that. But one suggestion that's never going to happen is that direct funds that are being donated um, for a resolution. And the last thing before we go to the next example is, Hiram, I wanted to ask you, what is the role of incentives and subsidies? Why is that important in a resolution? Sure. So kind of introducing the importance of these incentives and subsidies and resolutions. Uh, it kind of ties into that issue of funding, which a lot of model UN delegates don't get, right? Um, you need to kind of, in subsidies, at least when it comes to Parley Pro, for a country's parliamentary, uh, excuse me, in a country's parliamentary system, um, they need that grant to the sovereign for their state needs in order to fund those resolutions. So without a subsidy, you can't really go through uh, without a subsidy from the country's parliamentary system, you can't really go through which with funding that uh, that resolution. And uh, on the other hand, incentives for this resolution, they kind of encourage countries uh, by usually benefiting, whether it be their economies or their political system, there's usually some kind of benefit, which is meant to incentivize and encourage the countries to sign on and uh, agree with or even vote for your resolution. So that's the importance of those incentives and those subsidies. Absolutely. And to give an example, I know I mentioned universal health care, but let's say mm -hmm. that you want to build a hospital in Brazil because 
one of the areas doesn't have a hospital. Um, and if you are tackling universal healthcare, perhaps the nation of Brazil can offer that land if it's if it's publicly owned uh, at a, a cheaper price to a private developer to build that hospital. That is an incentive that is gonna get those private developers to come and build that hospital. Next, what if we actually give that hospital tax cuts? You know, that is going to incentivize good, good hospital management to come and develop that hospital. And same thing can be done for research. If we incentivize the research, uh, for example, collaboration between countries, and if they actually yield substantial results, right? They get some sort of monetary benefit, some sort of uh, stipend. So there's different ways to go about incentivizing countries, individuals to get things done. And, you know, we just went over three important things. I want you guys to keep this in mind, funding, subcommittees and incentives, right? These form the foundation of a resolution. If you have those three components, you can build on that and make an even better resolution. If you're missing one of those components, that is where the other dogs in the room are going to question you and tear your resolution apart during uh, questioning time. Um, but yeah, Rizwan, please go ahead and give your example, and then we will uh, end this meeting. Uh, it's the one after that. Next one. Oh, this one? Okay. Yeah. So um, this one uh, was for uh, my SOCOM committee at um, Atmon. Uh, this was, this is, you're going to look into um, social and cultural issues. So uh, the resolution that I created was the Triple R Action Plan, RRR. If you guys have watched the movie, we put that in the resolution just to add a, you know, uh, you know, a little humor. Um, it's a long day debating. So just having that little humor uh, may provide uh, that extra bit of, you know, emphasis um, for the chairs to remember as well. Um so our topic was discussing LGBTQ rights in the Middle East following the World Cup in Qatar. Um, so I was China. I showed this. My stance was shown in the um, the GSL example in the first video that we did. Um, but I didn't want to take too much of a uh, aggressive stance um, against or for uh, rights. So if we scroll down, um, you can see my preams here. Um, so a little up. Yeah, so my preams here. Um, uh, so the so the format you should probably have this. You should probably have this italicized, all bit italicized, especially the first verb. Um, but you know the way uh, it also may differ depending on the conference. This is how the format was for the conference that I went to. Um, it may depend uh, based on you know what conference it is. Um, so you know, just like Madan said, you really want to look at past resolutions as well by the actual UN. Um, so that first preem is actually based off of, you know, what the UN actually has in their resolutions, just like a starter. Um, so that's what I uh, looked into. And then I went into what I wanted to tackle, which is reports of torture, um, but also, you know, considering the religious and cultural beliefs behind many uh, laws that are uh, put towards LGBTQ groups. Um, so then moving on to then the uh, operative clauses. Um, what we wanted to do is we designed it kind of like a sandwich. Um, so we would have uh, first a respect to Middle Eastern countries, um, and then we'd have, you know, tackling the problem, which is torture. Um, and then we'd again recall for respect to Middle Eastern countries and their religious traditions and laws. Um, so this is where RRR comes in. We had respect, reform, uh, respect, report, and reform. So, uh, it was kind of modeled off of, you know, uh, Roosevelt's New Deal, also the movie as well, um, just to have a little funny tale to it, funny twist. Um, so then we first we created various programs that involve social media campaigns. Um, and then, like Madan said, you need the funding. This one we did the World Bank and IMF. Um, for realistically, you should probably not do both. Um, we kind of had to write this in a rush. Um, so just make sure you're looking at your resolution and, I wouldn't do both in this situation. Um, and then the programs, then we had like a purpose. You want to be as specific as possible, um, support for more freedom, and then the need for a fair and equal governmental view on LGBTQ people, um, and then amongst those who are not LGBTQ identifying. 
And then we went into a subcommittee. Uh, you know, there's that keyword again, Madanch mentioned it, a subcommittee, so important. It's vital to your resolution um, and how things are operated and the oversight needed. Um, so we want to tackle inhumane actions of governments. This is just looking at reports, this is the report part of it. Um, and then uh, what we want to do with those reports, which is advice given to the Qatari government uh, in terms of reform given to the Qatari police to stop torture. And then I went into uh, endorsing. This is where we use NGOs. Um, this is where you need to have an example. This does not have an example. Like I said, we were in kind of a rush, um, but you should probably have an example here of an NGO uh, to, that you're going to fund. Um, it was We were just lucky that nobody called us out on that. Um, but make sure you have one uh, just for an example of what you're going to fund. And then there's a communal fund. So we're having that, you know, World Bank, IMF and a communal fund. Those are really the main three that we, you'll see um, for funding. Um, and then uh, we had a little bit of a unique solution, creation of departments within international embassies to initiate non embargo communication between globalized human rights organizations and local bu budding NGOs. This is really important is to have that unique solution. Um, this is the, one of the things that took our resolution to the top um, and made it uh, pass is having that uniqueness. Um, and then we had social media campaigns uh, with this time local NGOs. And then there was that sandwich again is recognizing the sovereignty and autonomy of, uh, autonomy of Qatar to create laws. Um, and then uh, just to make sure that NGOs did not deviate from their purpose. Um, and then, yeah, that was it. So we did we for, did it like a sandwich, um, which is a you know an analogy to use. This is, it may differ based on conference to conference the way you want to structure it, um, but just make sure you're very specific as well. This resolution is uh, is not as specific, um, and uh, that's something that is needs to be emphasized in the future. Absolutely, thank you, Rizwan. And before we end the call, I want to give a chair's perspective. So harm. When you are kind of assessing your delegates, uh, you've been a chair multiple times. In when they are writing resolutions, are you what, what is the chair's perspective on resolutions, and how do delegates effectively, you know, present themselves to the chairs and write a good, re good resolution? So, are you referring to kind of the process of the, writing the resolutions, or does that also include like presenting them as well? No, I think it's it's mainly about the resolution content itself. Like this, okay. how did that uh, affect the chair's decision making uh, when they're choosing an award? Of course. So first thing I look for in a resolution is, um, well, obviously, which delegates are writing it, which blocks. Uh, you know, very important to know who the authors of the resolution are, the supporters. Um, after that, as a chair, it's kind of focusing on. You know, Rizwan mentioned this a lot previously, but how specific the resolution is, um, how creative the, the solutions to the problem are. Uh, is it clear that they've, you know, they're showing that they've done the research in regard to their country's stance and in regard to the topic? So if I see the delegate from China signing on to investigate uh, or signing on to some anti-communist legislation or resolution, that's not going to pass. That's not going to fly if you're representing China. Um, so kind of seeing how they balance out their own country's stance and actually uh, contributing to uh, collaborating with the rest of the committee, even if there might be disagreements. That's pretty important too. But uh, again, still keeping into consideration how accurately they are representing and benefiting their country's stance. Um, like I said, the example from China previously. And now, on the other hand, um, I also do try to make sure that uh, they are accurately giving information you know, ensuring that the information that they they put on the resolution uh, is somewhat accurate. If they just provide a random name of a subcommittee in the UN, which is just, uh, you know, it's given the inappropriate role. Um, you know, they state some random subcommittee name that's already existing and they, they try to uh, claim it does one thing when in reality it does another just to benefit their the resolution stance that's not really going to fly either so just making sure everything's very detailed uh it's accurate toward the country's stance it makes sense that a country would sign on a certain country would sign on to the resolution and that it's uh that it's somewhat accurate and shows that they've done their research that's basically it when it comes to those resolutions absolutely thank you harm 
And of course, being a sponsor is a very good way to um, tell the chair that you are writing resolution so they know that you are responsible for this for this resolution. Additionally, the questioning. If you're if other delegates are not able to ask questions and, and you are able to answer all of them effectively, that is another way that the chair is impressed um, with the content as well as your ability to uh, write the resolution and its details. And also if you also if you give like good pro-con speeches yes. or, or against the resolution, even if you're not part of the resolution, you can still give a speech for it or you can still give a speech against it depending on your perspective if you weren't able to be a sponsor of the resolution you can still boost your participation um for the chair um just by giving like a pro con speech and maybe adding your own country's perspective and a couple of new ideas if you can and uh even if just to add on before we end real quick um you know even if you aren't like the main guy it's important to may try to have like maybe uh be in charge of an operative clause, um, something that you can speak about, uh, something that you can, something that you can bring to the table. Um, just like you know, I've had uh, instances where you know maybe I'm not the leading, like the leading guy, but I'm right there in terms of you know I have I control a certain certain set of operative clauses that makes me vocal and allows me to participate in the conversation. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for this session of our model UN presentations. We know this one was longer than usual, but resolution writing is the most important part of model UN. And this is the part that takes delegates the most time to master. So please come to meetings, practice, uh, mock conferences, come speak to us officers when you have a chance and show us um, that maybe an example and we can look it over. So good luck on your journey and we'll see you next time.